from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium 2019, brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Welcome back to MIT, everybody. You're watching The Cube, the leader in live tech coverage. We're here at day two of the MIT Chief Data Officer Information Quality Conference. Dave Vellante with Paul Gillen. Andy Palmer is here. He's the co-founder and CEO of Tamer. Good to see you again. It's great to see you, Dave. Thanks for coming on. So, I didn't ask this to Mike. I can kind of infer from some of his answers, but why did you guys start Tamer? Well, it really started with an academic project that Mike was doing over at MIT, and uh, I was over at Novartis at the time as the chief data officer over there, and what we really found was that uh, there were a lot of companies really suffering from data mastering as the primary bottleneck in their company. They had used great new tech like the uh, Vertica system that we had built and um, you know, automated a lot of their warehousing and such, but the, the real bottleneck was getting lots of data integrated and mastered really, really quickly. Yeah, he took us through the sort of problems with, with well obviously the EDW in terms of scaling, but yep. master data management and and the scaling problems. Was, it, was that really the problem that you were trying to solve? Was yeah, it, really, to scale? it really was. And when we started, I mean, it was like seven years ago, eight years ago now um, that we started the company and, and maybe almost 10 when we started working on the academic project. And at that time, people weren't really thinking or worried about that. They were still kind of digesting big data, uh, as it was called. But I think what Mike and I kind of felt was going on was that people were going to sort of get over the, 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 the big data um, and the volume of data, and they were going to start worrying about the variety of the data and how to make the data cleaner and more organized. And, uh, and I, th I think we, we called that one uh, pretty much right. Maybe we were a little bit early, but, um, but I think now variety is the big problem. Well, well the other thing about you know, big data, big data is oftentimes associated with Hadoop, which was a batch. And, and then you sort of saw the shift to real time and Spark was going to fix all that. And, and, and so what are you seeing in terms of the, the, the trends in terms of how data is being used to drive like almost near real time business decisions? Yeah, well you know Mike and I came out really specifically back in 2007 and declared that we thought uh, Hadoop and HDFS was going to be uh, 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 far less impactful than other people 07. thought. 07. Yeah, yeah, and Mike, Mike actually was really aggressive in saying it was going to be a disaster. And I think we've finally seen that actually play out a bit now, um, that the, the bloom is off the rose, so to speak. And, um, and so there, there are these fundamental things that, that, that big companies struggle with in terms of their data and uh, you know, cleaning it up and organizing it and making it high quality. Anybody that's worked at one of these big companies can tell you that the data that they get from most of their internal systems sucks. It's plain and simple. And so cleaning up that data, turning it into something that's an asset rather than a uh, liability is really what, what Tamer's all about. And it's kind of our mission. Um, we're out there to, to do this. And it, it sort of pales in comparison. You think about the amount of money that some of these companies have spent on systems like SAP. Uh, and you're like, yeah, but all the data inside of these systems is so bad and so uh, uh, ugly and, and unuseful. Like, we got to fix that problem. So you're, you're, uh, I mean, your special sauce is machine learning. Uh, where are you applying machine learning most, most effectively? Where we they... apply machine learning to probably the least sexy problem on the planet. Um, there are a lot of companies out there that use machine learning and AI to uh, you know, do predictive algorithms and all kinds of cool stuff. All we do with machine learning is actually use it to clean up data and organize data, get it ready for people to, to use AI. And I, I, I started uh, in uh, the AI industry back in the late 1980s uh, and uh, you know, really, I, I learned from this guy Marvin Minsky, and Mar Marvin taught me two things. Uh, first was garbage in, garbage out. There's no algorithm that's worth anything unless you've got great data. And the second one is it's always about the human and the machine working together. And I've really been working on those two same principles most of my career, and Tamer really brings both of those together. Our goal is to prepare data so that it can be used analytically inside of these companies, that it's actually high quality and useful. And the way we do that involves bringing together the machine, mostly these advanced machine learning algorithms, with humans, subject matter experts inside of these co companies that actually know all the ins and outs and all the intricacies of the data inside of their company. So and the, uh, oh, sorry, ahead, as they say, uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have good training data, of course you're not going to have a good ML model. Mm -hmm. How much, how much well, upfront work is required. GE, I know, is one of your customers. I mean, yeah. How much time is required to put together 
uh, an ML model that can that can deal with you know, 20 million records like that. Well, you know, the amazing thing that that's happened for us in the last five years, especially, is that now we've got we've built enough models from scratch inside of these large global 2,000 companies <coughs> that very rarely do we go into a place where there we don't already have a model that's pre-built that they can use as a starting point. And I think that's the same thing that's happening in modeling in general. If you look at great companies like Data Robot, um, and and even in in the the the, the the Python community, MLlib, that the accessibility of these modeling tools and the models themselves are actually so, uh, they're, they're, they're commoditized. And so most of our models and most of the projects we work on, we've already got a model that's a starting point. We don't really have to start from scratch. You mentioned going into AI in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Is, the, is the, the notion of AI, is it the same as it was in the 80s? And now we've just got the tooling, the horsepower, the data to yeah. take advantage of it, or has the concept changed? The math is all the same. Like, you know, absolutely full stop. Like, there's really no new math. Um, the, th the two things I think that have changed are first, there's a lot more data that's available now. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, neural nets are a great example, right? Yeah. One of Marvin's things. Um, that you know, when you look at Google Translate and how aggressively they use neural nets, it was the quantity of data that was available that actually made neural nets work. Um, the second thing that, that's, that's changed is the uh, cheap availability of compute. Uh, that now the largest supercomputer in the world is available to rent uh, by the minute. Yeah. Um, and so you've got all this data, you've got all this really cheap compute. And then third thing is what you alluded to earlier, the accessibility of all the math um, that now it's becoming so simple and easy to apply these math techniques and, um, and they're becoming, you know, it's, it's almost to the point where the average data scientist, not the advanced one, the average data scientist can do AI, uh, practice AI techniques that 20 years ago re required five PhDs. Yeah. It's not surprising that Google, with its you know, neural net technology and all the search you know, data that it has, has been so successful. Mm. Does it surprise you that, that Amazon with Alexa was able to, to compete so effectively? Oh, I think that uh, I would never underestimate uh, Amazon and their ability to you know, build great tech. They've, they've done some amazing work. One of my favorite, uh, Mike and I actually, one of our favorite examples, in the last uh, three years, they took their Redshift system you know, that competed with, with Vertica, yeah, of um, and they, uh, they re-implemented it and uh, it, you know, as a compiled system, and it really runs incredibly fast. I, I mean, it, that that uh, feat of, of engineering was was truly exceptional. It's interesting to hear you say that because because it wasn't Redshift uh, it was originally a Par Excel. Yeah, tech. that's right. So that's Larry right. Ellison craps all over Redshift because ah, oh, it's just open source software yeah. that they just took and repackaged. But you're saying they did some major engineering to oh it. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. It, it's like Mike and I both, you know, we, we, we never, you know, we always compared Par Excel to Vertica and, you know, we, we always knew we were better in a whole bunch of ways. But this, this latest rewrite that they've done, uh, this compiled version, like, it's really good. So as a guy who's been doing AI for 30 years now and, and it's really seeing it come into its own, you know, a lot of AI projects, it seems right now, are, are sort of low-hanging fruit. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of small-scale stuff. Where do you see AI in five years? What kind yeah. of projects are, going to, are, are companies going to be undertaking? You know, what kind of new applications are going to come out of this phenomenon? I think we're at the very beginning uh, of this cycle, and actually there's a lot more potential than has been realized. So I think we are in the, the pick the low-hanging fruit kind of a thing, but some of the potential uh, applications of AI are, are, are so much more impactful, especially as we modernize core infrastructure in the enterprise. So the enterprise is, is sort of living with this huge legacy burden, and uh, we always are encouraging at Tamer, our, our customers, to think of all their existing legacy systems as just data generating machines. And the faster they can get that data into a state where they can start doing state of the art AI work on top of it, the better. And so um, we really, you know, you've got to put the, the legacy burden aside and kind of draw this line in the sand so that as you really get build their muscles on the AI side, that you can take advantage of that with all the data that they're generating every single day. So if you think about these data repositories, enterprise data warehouse, you guys built better, you know, with MPP technology, better data warehouses, yep. then you have you know the master data management stuff, the top-down. Uh, you, you know, uh, yeah. data enterprise data models, Hadoop and, and big data. Um, none of them really lived up to their promise. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, yeah. it's a kind of somewhat unfair to, 
to, to like the MPP guys? Because you said, no, hey, we're just going to run faster. And you did, but yeah. you didn't say you were going to change the world and all that stuff, right. whereas EDW did. Do you feel like this next wave is actually going to live up to the promise? I think the next phase is, and it's very logical. Like, you know, I know you're talking to Chris Lynch here in a minute and, you know, what they're doing at AtScale. And AtScale and Tamer, these companies are all in the same general area that's kind of related to how do you take all this data and actually prepare it and turn it into something that's consumable really quickly and easily for all of these new data consumers in the enterprise. And like, so that, that's the next logical phase in this process. Now, will this phase be the one that finally sort of uh, meets the high expectations that were set 20, 30 years ago with enterprise data warehousing? I don't know, but we're certainly getting closer uh, to well, it. Well, I kind of hope not, because then we'll have less to do. <laughs> 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 Any other cool stuff yeah. that you see out there that, you know, as a technologist? Yeah, that I, you're I, I'm huge, I'm fanatical right now about healthcare. I, I think that the opportunity for uh, healthcare to be transformed with technology is, uh, you know, almost makes everything else look like chump change. Um, what aspect of healthcare? Well, uh, I think that the, the, the most obvious thing is that now with the consumer sort of in the driver's seat in, in healthcare, that, um, technology companies that come in and provide consumer-driven solutions uh, that meet the needs of patients, regardless of how dysfunctional the healthcare system is, um, are th that's killer stuff. We had a great company here in Boston called PillPack. It was a great example of that, where they just build something better for consumers, and it was so popular and so you know, broadly adopted. Again, again, eventually Amazon bought it for a billion dollars. But those kinds of things in healthcare, the, the PillPack is just the beginning. There's lots and lots of those kinds of opportunities. Well, it's ripe, healthcare's ripe for disruption, mm. and it hasn't been you know, hit with the digital disruption yet. Neither has financial services really, certainly defense has, has not yet, and other industries. Yeah. They're high risk industries, so Absolutely. You know, it's, it takes longer. Well, Andy, thanks so much for making the time. It's great I know, to I see know you, you got to run. Yeah, it's great awesome to see seeing you. you. Yeah, okay, thanks. take care. Great to, All right, great keep to it right there, everybody. Thanks we'll be back with our next guest right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE from MIT CDOIQ. Right back. <laughs>